Monday. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Hallelujah. Were we blessed last week by Pastor Jim Schreiner, that message? Well, that was awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome message. Uh, really good stuff. God is, um, God is keeping us from, from deception. Keeping us from getting caught up out there in some things that uh, will lead us down a road to destruction. I was blessed, you know, uh, this week, I think it was, to learn of a, one, of my, one of my favorite speakers, teachers in the body of Christ, one of the generals, uh, who had gotten out there teaching that same goofy grace stuff. He was out there teaching that goofy grace, and I... I mean, my wife and I partners in his ministry and him and his wife and everything, and, and uh, I just couldn't even listen to him. I'm like, man, this guy is teaching his goofy grace. And he said it so much, he said as much himself that he was preaching it because he heard this other guy who we were partners with preaching it. And uh, just got not there. And I was blessed. I went on his website. You know, okay, I'm, I'm going to call his name Dr. Leroy Thompson. Uh, you know, he was, uh, was on his website on a... I just want to check and see. Maybe I'm praying for these guys. And uh, I noticed all his grace teachings that he had been teaching all year had been removed from his website, removed from all of his stuff. And I said, well, what in the world happened? Thank you, Jesus. And uh, listen to the, the next message in line. And he stood up before his whole church, whole church and said, I was teaching this stuff in error. He said, this is error. This is heresy. He said, I, in my spirit, I knew this is wrong. He said, I was preaching it, but when I went and studied with these guys, he went, you know, they got the whole grace camp now. They have grace conferences and institutes where you go and learn how to preach this stuff here. He said, I went in there and studied, and I said, wait a minute, something wrong with These guys taking out scriptures. They taking books out the Bible, trying to prove this, this message. He said, this is error. Telling people you ain't got to repent, there ain't no conviction. He said, this is error. So I was, I mean, one of the biggest things for me this week is an answer prayer that a man of God I highly respect and love has said, no, this is wrong. I'm going back to preaching this thing right. That's big. That's big for a man to stand in front of his church and to have thousands of people that follow him online throughout the world. He has hundreds of pastors that are under his covering. And he called them all in. Said, hey, we got, let's get this thing straight. I've led you guys wrong. That's big. So there's, there's hope. If we keep praying, there's hope that we'll get this thing right. The body of Christ will get it right, and we'll, people will not be part of this. Because the Bible says, before the coming of the Lord, there will be a great falling away. But we don't have to be part of that falling away. There are people that are going to fall away. Serve God for 20 and 30 years and fall away. And miss out on heaven, miss out on eternal life because they got out there and, and fell away. But I thank God for people like Brother Thompson who said, oh, this is, this is wrong. Let me get back on what? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So I'll just say that, you know, that message last week about do not be deceived, that's, that's important. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, let's get into the word of God for this morning. Psalm 113. Psalm 113. Let's read the entire psalm. Since we have time. Psalm 113. I'm going to focus on two verses, but let's read the entire one. You ready? All right. Starting at verse 1, Psalm 113. Ready? Read. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home, 
like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. Well, why don't you do that just a moment? Just take a moment. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Verse 7 again says, he raises the poor out of the dust. Verse 7, y'all see that? He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. Today I want to talk, we're continuing our series on the maximized life, and uh, we're on part six this morning, and we're calling this message today, Making Something Out of Nothing. Making something, you know, because God specializes in making somethings out of nothings, making somebodies out of nobodies. I'm sure I've got two or three witnesses this morning that God has taken nothing and made something out of our lives. So we're going to talk about that this morning. Father, thank you this morning for the privilege we have, the opportunity to uh, delve into your word, to, to dive in and hear and receive what you have to say. Speak, Lord, for your servants. We, we hear. We're ready. We are sure that what you say is right. We are sure that what you say is proven. It is true. And God, whatever you say today, we choose to believe. We don't just hear. We believe. We accept your word and know it to be true. We think that as we believe, it will work effectively in our lives. We're going to get superhuman power to produce the maximized life. So let it be so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, take your seats today in the house of God. Making something out of nothing. Making something out of nothing. Yeah. Hallelujah. Over in Ephesians 3, verse 19, that's been our, our foundation where we've been uh, in this series here. Ephesians 3, verse 19 where Paul, part of Paul's grant request uh, to God for the body of Christ is that we would know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, and that we be filled with what? All the fullness. Y'all got Ephesians 3.19? That we be filled with all the fullness of God. I need y'all to stick with me this morning. Because this is going to take some turns here. I need to make sure I don't lose you on a turn here. So we want to be filled with all the fullness of God. And so, and again, God wants us to be filled with uh, his fullness full of life, according to uh, Ephesians 3.20, so that he can do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. According to the what? Power. The power that works in us. That power is the fullness of God that works in us. Remember we defined, or, or rather pulled that word uh, fullness up in, from the Greek, uh, the word pleroma which is uh, talking about New Testament believers being filled with the presence, the power, the agency, and the riches of God and of Christ. So to be filled with his presence, to be filled with his power, that's the power that works in us in Ephesians 3.20. So the great things God does or can do for us is only in accordance with the power that's on the inside of us. Amen. So the level of us being full of him determines the level of what he can do exceeding abundantly. Are y'all seeing that? Because the exceeding abundantly is according to the power that works in us. Got it? All right? So in other words, if there's a little power, there's little ability for God to do exceeding abundantly above. Okay? So we want to get filled with the fullness of God. Now, we've been talking here again about the maximized life, and what we've said is that the maximized life all begins... And I want to change the words. We had said it begins and ends with the word of God, but I want to change it to say it begins and increases with the word of God. Oh, okay. Because the maximized life doesn't have an end. That's right. So the Lord corrected me on that. It doesn't have an end. It, ha it only increases. God says, I increase you more and more. So not only here in the natural, should our lives get better and better every day, should our lives get better and better every week, every month, every year, even every generation, but even once you and I depart this earth, it doesn't go downhill from here. Because the moment you and I got saved, we began eternal life. We began the God kind of life. We entered into that. So it doesn't end for us. It only increases more and more. Amen? Now, there were several things we said had to happen. If, you, if you've been walking through this thing with us, we said, number one, we got to hear the word. This is the stage of the transformation because the, the word is what does all this. I got to hear the word. Faith comes by hearing. hearing, hearing by the word of God. And since faith comes, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. 
faith. So it begins with hearing the word of God. We said, number two, we got to believe the word, right? First uh, Thessalonians uh, uh, 2, 2, 13 talks about how, in the Amplified, talks about the word works effectively in you who believe. Okay? It works effectively, in fact, gives us superhuman power in those of us who believe. So I got to believe the word. Everybody say, I believe the word. I believe the word. Now, it's, it's interesting. Hearing is not believing. No. We went over that in Luke chapter 8. Hearing is not the same as believing. Many people come and hear the word every Sunday, hear the word on Wednesday, and never believe it. Oh, I believe it. I shout. You hear me shout? Shout don't mean you believe it. Shout just means it sound good to your spirit and, you know, sound, might, might even sound good to your soul. But believing always means actions follow. Okay? So the word works effectively in those of us who believe. So we got to hear the word. Number two, believe the word. Number three, we become uh, new creations. We, we are born again. Everybody say, I'm already born again. I know you are, but, 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 but we need to be born again again. <laughs> That's what happened to a Sister Elise, what she talked about. She got born again again. First Peter uh, 1.23, we've been used, we looked at this scripture here, uh, last couple of messages, which says, tells us that we've been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides Forever. So we've been born again of what again? Incorruptible. incorruptible seed. Incorruptible seed. And what we, what we shared Wednesday night, if you missed Wednesday night, you missed a, a pivotal key to your, to your future. That incorruptible seed is what produces the incorruptible life. And you and I, the Bible says, have already been uh, delivered from corruption. We've already, according to, to, uh, to Peter's word, Escaped corruption. Escape. Corruption is decay, deterioration. Uh, we could, it looks like poverty, lack, sickness, disease, That's debt, it. destruction. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Drama, confusion. That's what it looks like. But the Bible says you and I, are y'all listening to me? Yes. The Bible says you and I have already escaped corruption. Yes. Well, Pastor, why am I still dealing with all this corruption stuff? Because the Bible says in Galatians 6, remember that? We read that? That he, to, he that sows to the flesh, well, of the flesh reap corruption. So even though you've, you and I have escaped corruption, which means debt, lack, poverty, sickness, disease, drama, confusion, all these things have no place and no authority to work in our lives. If we keep sowing to the flesh, we give it place in our lives. But you and I, you got to catch this. We have escaped corruption. Those things have no, no uh, right to operate in our lives. you got to catch that. The Bible says we've escaped the corruption that comes into the world through lust, okay? Now, what we were talking about Wednesday night, we, we were delving this about renewing the mind because that's what needs to happen. That's what happened in the least. Is when I say get born again again, it's a renewing of the mind. We got we to gotta be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Amen. Romans 12, uh, verse 1, 2. Let's look at that real quick. Romans 12, 1, 2, which says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by what? Mercy of God, that you present your bodies a what? Yes. Living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2 says, and be not what? Conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not good or acceptable or perfect. Good and, 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 and. God's will is good, accept, yeah, come on, that's good, and, acceptable and perfect. He only has one will. He only has one will. It's perfect, acceptable and good. And it's, it's, it's for you to prosper and increase. And I'm going to get into more of what his will looks like for our lives today. Okay? So, but he says, to get to that, I've got to be transformed. Which means my original state is not conducive to, to God's perfect will. The original state I was born in. Even when you and I get born again, we're not ready. We, we're not ready to handle what God is What's good and, and acceptable and perfect for us? 
so I've got to be transformed. And to be transformed, how do I do that? By the renewing of my mind. My mind. My mind, my soul, will and emotions, all, my, my soul, which is my mind, will and emotions, all that, that stuff, how I think, how I feel, how I choose, how I process, how I process yes. has to change. Right. Now, how do we do that? By the word of God. So the more I meditate the word of God, I begin to change now, all right? Now, notice here again, he says in verse uh, 2, he says, be transformed by the renewing of, the, of your mind. Now, if we compare that to another verse, another verse we know, you don't have to turn to it but because we, we know it, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17, which says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have what? And all things have? Okay, now go back to the last verse we just read. Be transformed. By doing my mind. Now go back to the, this verse. It says, old things have passed away, all things have become new. What? It seemed like something already changed. See, if you, if you, if you marry these scriptures, as, as Leroy Thomas says, you box them against each other, you, you'll see, wait a minute, it, it looks like I got, a, I got an issue here. Because on the one hand, it says, I am a new creation. On the one hand, it says, old, says, old things have already passed away. It all, it all, on one hand, it says, all things have become new. Yet the same writer says you need to be transformed. So what, what we look at here is that what, what 2 Corinthians 5.17 talks about is, is an inner working. In that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation on the inside. My spirit. Does anybody agree with that? Amen. That my spirit is new. My spirit has been reborn. My spirit has been recreated. I am new. My spirit man is new. But what your old uh, preacher used to tell you was incorrect when they used to say, when, you know, I got saved. I looked at my hands, and my hands were new. Looked at my feet, and they were too. No, that's not true because my hands were still the same. My feet were still the same. Everything about me was still the same. I still had all the same uh, uh, things that I looked at. I still had the same cravings, still had the same desires. Right? Yet I'm new. But I've got to be transformed. Transform transformation is not an instant change, but a, a, a process. You got it? So, yes, when I got born again, I was instantly changed in my spirit. But I've got to now renew my mind because my mind is the filter. My mind is the valve. My mind is the control valve of my life. You understand that? My mind is what makes me cuss somebody out or bless them. Not your spirit. Your spirit ain't going to cuss nobody out. Your mind is, is what determines wh whether, whether you, you tithe or give or whether you hold back. It's, it's your mind. Your spirit already knows it's the right thing to do. Your, your, your spirit already knows you're not going to cheat on your spouse or do anything like that. But it's your, your soul, your mind. You understand? So, so, so something has to happen. A transformation has to take place, which means my mind has to be renewed. And my mind is renewed by what? The word of God. Y'all getting this so far? Now, so something has to happen. Let's go to Philippians 2, uh, 12 and 13 real quick. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. If you're in Ephesians, or I don't know where you are, but in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Hallelujah. How many of y'all here are saved? All right, so if you're saved, you're already a new creation right now. You're a new creation right now. But watch what he says here to the saved people. Philippians 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, obeyed not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, do what? Work out your own salvation. So that salvation that happened on the inside, now I got to work it out. 
See, people, people look at that, they say work it out means just, you know, just figure it out. No, you ain't got to figure out salvation. God has already given us the plan, the roadmap of salvation. So when he says work it out, he don't mean work it out like, okay, let me see if I can work this over. No, by work it out, he means work it out. Because he's going to contrast that with the next verse. Because the next verse, he says, verse 13, for it is God who works in. See, so you're working it out because God is working in you both to will and to do for or of his good pleasure. Okay? So that transformation of renewing my mind is, is, is I'm, I'm working out the salvation. God is working me. He's working me. He's helping me with the will and the do. The will and the do. He helps to get my will right. You can't do the do unless your will is right. Well, I guess, you, I guess you can. I guess some people can fake the doing. You can do things, and at that point, it's just religious. It's just works. But when you get the will right, the do will produce fruit. That's right. That's it. Got it? So he gives us the will and the do of his good pleasure. Now, what is his good pleasure? Luke 12, 32 tells us that it is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Amen. Luke 12, 32, y'all know that scripture? Jesus says, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure. Come on. Y'all got it? I just quoted it. It's your father's good pleasure to do what? To give you the kingdom. So he just said, your father's working in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Now, Jesus told us what his good pleasure is. Is to give us the kingdom. All right. Praise God. You'll get excited later on. Now, so I got born again through the word. The word is incorruptible seed that's supposed to produce an incorruptible life. I'm now saved, but I got to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. God is working in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure, which is all to get me to the point to give me the kingdom, but on my part, it's to receive the kingdom. And God won't give me something I'm not ready to receive. You can pray for a wife or a husband all you want to, but if you've not readied yourself to receive, he, he, don't, he don't want to get you messed up. You can pray for a, for a million dollar mansion all you want to, but if you've not prepared to receive, you can pray for business opportunities, but if you've not pray, prepared yourself to receive it, he, he's not going to do that. You understand that? So God would only give you as far as you prepared yourself to receive because God is not going to waste anything. You understand that? Jesus Christ was so adamant about not wasting that when he fed 5,000 men plus women and children and they had 12 basketfuls left, he said, go and make sure you gather everything, that there be no waste, there be no, nothing remain. I don't want to leave any fragments. Gather it all up. He's, he is totally against waste. You understand that? So you have to make sure that we're prepared to receive whatever God's going to give. That's a word for somebody here. That's a word for somebody in here. Hallelujah. Now, so again, his good pleasure is to give us what? The kingdom. Thank you. Now, but we can't receive the kingdom until we get kingdom-minded. And most of us are not naturally accustomed to royalty or greatness because we started out on the bottom rung of society. Mm -hmm. I'm looking, I'm in the right place, I know it. Most of us, nine-tenths of us, probably the other person too, started out on the bottom rung of society. Not many of you I look at were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Not many of you that I look at were born in, into an, uh, an, an aristocracy. You weren't born with all kind of regal lineage that you know of. Oh, well, I, no, back in Africa. No, you listen. I don't want to hear that. Yeah, I know you, kings and princes and all that stuff back in Africa, but you can't even trace your lineage. Yeah, that, that's been so wiped out, you can't go past so many generations. So, 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 
I mean, let's, let's not talk about it. Let's, let's talk about the fact that when you were born in America, born into this culture, into this society, we were born, most of us, uh, on the bottom rung of society. And so it's interesting, Thomas, when I talk about the maximized life and this kingdom life, it's so hard for people to grasp that. It's so hard for, for people to, to conceive and to imagine a life without corruption, a maximum life, a life where I enjoy uh, prosperity and, and, and physical health because we've been used to, to going to a funeral every, every six months from somebody in our family dying from high blood pressure and diabetes and cancer. And it's hard for us to imagine, you know, this, this life that I'm talking about. You know, Pastor, you're talking about a fantasy life. No, it's not the fantasy life. It is the kingdom life. It is the maximized life, and it is ours, but I have to prepare myself to receive that. And i got to spend more time meditating the word of God as opposed to meditating uh, all the obituaries and all my family history and all that stuff and all the news and all the things that go on that, that when I meditate those things, that becomes corruptible seed. And if I keep taking in corruptible seed, I reap corruption. It's a law. Are y'all getting this here? All right, now... So we're not accustomed to that. But it has always been Father God's desire and plan for his chosen people to live and operate on a higher level. On, on a level of, of royalty. That's always been God's plan. I told you that Wednesday night uh, when, when God uh, created Adam. He made Adam, he formed Adam from the dust of the earth. Some, some translations say the topsoil. <laughs> He made him from, from the best on the earth. But even when he did that, he didn't just make him breathe like he had made the other animals breathe. He breathed himself into him. And then, and because God put himself into Adam, Adam was now a God man and a king on the earth. He had to create a home and environment for him that was conducive, that, 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 that fit what was on the inside of Adam. So God planted a garden in Eastwood and Eden. God made a replica of heaven on the earth. So man started with heaven on earth. But when lust got involved, corruption then entered, and then now everything began to decay. Man began to die, and all these things began to happen. So now we've been so used to dying and decay and death and destruction, when we have no concept of, of the quality of life that God really means for us to enjoy. I'm talking to somebody here. So God's trying to get us back to a place where we begin to expect and look for, the, for a quality of life. Amen. Hallelujah. Now let me show you something here. Because I told you it's always been God's plan, right? Yeah. Go to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Yeah. Hallelujah. Y'all yeah. work with me here this morning. Here. Anybody praying with me? Y'all yeah. <laughs> going to pray with me? Yeah. Hallelujah. Exodus 19, verse 1. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day, to the third month to the day, that they had gone out of the land of Egypt. Now, he couldn't talk much about this to them while they were in Egypt. They had to come out of Egypt to begin to talk about these things to him, to, 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 to those people. Got it? So that's why it's so important for you and I to come out of Egypt. Now, if you're born again, you've now come out of Egypt physically or, 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 or your inner man. But you, we know Abba's of Israel, they came out of Egypt, but many of them still had Egypt on inside of them. And that's the issue with most of us in the body of Christ is that we still have Egypt and corruption on the inside of us. And God's going to get that out of us so we can go to where he wants us to go. Now watch what he tells them here. In verse, verse 2, I'm going ahead to verse 2. For they had departed from Rephidim and come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God. This is the man of God now. This is what he does. This is what he does. He goes up to God. <laughs> and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus shall you preach to the house of Jacob. This is what I want you to preach. 
Don't preach to them they're going to be poor, broke, bust, and disgusted. See how much government security, social security, government welfare, disability they can get. See how long they can stay on unemployment. Don't preach that to them. Don't, don't go preaching to the children of Israel that the Egyptians owe y'all reparations. I'm telling you, see y'all that sin. See, because this is what, this what people still preaching in the black church that we still need to wait on the government because the government still got to pay us for 400 some years of slavery. I tell you what, if you're going to wait on that, you're going to be waiting a long time. I ain't got time to wait on the reparations. I'm looking to what? To God's preparations. God has already prepared something for me. So I ain't waiting on somebody to give me, pay me something for, for what they did to my grandparents and great-grandparents, and, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not slighting that. But I'm, he didn't tell Moses, Moses, you go preach to them people. They have been enslaved for 400 years. Hard labor, 400 years. All those, all those uh, sphinxes and pyramids, they built this stuff. But the man of God wasn't told to preach that. Look at what he, he's told. He says, thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. I didn't put you on the backs of chickens and roosters and hens. I, In other words, God said, I, I wanted you to fly out of that first class. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's eagle's wings, that first, first class coming out of Egypt. Yeah, 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 yeah. He brings us out in style. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He says, I brought you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Yeah. That's the reason why he said I brought you to myself is because I'm, I'm going to take care of you. Yeah. I don't want you looking back to anybody else. I don't want you looking to Egypt. I don't look, want you looking around. I want you looking to me. I brought you to myself. Now watch what he says here. He says, verse 5. Now therefore, if you, if you, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be what? A special treasure to me. Come on. Say it again now. Above all, notice God, his mindset for his people is always to distinguish us above. Isn't it interesting most of the body of Christ trying to fit in with the world when God's trying to put us above the world? In every area of your life? He says, I'm going to make you a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine. Everything on this planet is his. And I'm going to make you my special treasure, though. In other words, I'm going, to, I'm going to favor you above everything on the planet. He says, all the earth is mine, but you're a special treasure. Now watch what he says here. Verse 6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Or some translations will say, you shall be to me a nation of kings and priests. Y'all didn't catch that. He, he's, not, he's not telling, telling them, you know, y'all going to be second-class citizens and, you know, poor folks in society and disenfranchised. See, we keep trying to, praise God. We keep trying, trying to work these labels on ourselves about us being disenfranchised. And, you know, listen, I, I can't wear that label. I'm not disenfranchised. I came out on eagle's wings. Hallelujah. Praise God. See, I don't, I, don't, I don't look for nobody to owe me nothing. They don't owe me nothing. Because what if you did pay me what you owe me, it wouldn't even compare to what God already prepared for me. He says, but you're going to be a nation of a uh, kingdom of priests and a whole nation or a nation of kings and priests. So you notice here God wanted to raise them to a level. He says a kingdom. 
when these people had watched Pharaoh and his kingdom and all the wealth they had stolen and enjoyed, they had gotten the wealth of the whole world. And, and now they're coming out, they're, they're, they're just fresh three months from being slaves. They're three months of the day from being slaves. And he's already talking about a kingdom. Yeah, you got you to catch this. He, 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 in other words, God said, from jump, I want you to come out with this mindset. From jump, I want you to move forward from, from this day forward with that mindset that wherever you're going, wherever I'm taking you, it's going to be to make you a kingdom of people. Hallelujah. Now watch this. Let's, let's, man. Uh, let's look at Revelation. I'm going to skip all the way over here. Revelation chapter 1. Glory to God. Revelation chapter 1. Well, Pastor, that was just the children of Israel. All right, Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. This is Revelation of Jesus Christ. This is Jesus being revealed and what he's revealing for the body of Christ. John 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches. So this is a church word here. Which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who is, and who was, and who is to come. That's God. And from the seven spirits, this is the spirit of God, who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, Christ, right? And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the faithful witness, the, that's important, firstborn, don't forget that, firstborn, firstborn from the dead, firstborn from the dead, firstborn from the dead. Now, if he's firstborn, there must be second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and eighth and tenth and 125,000th and 784 millionth. I don't know which number I am, but I'm in that number somewhere. He's the firstborn. I'm in the family. You're catching this, right? Now, he's the firstborn and the ruler over who? The kings of the earth. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. We'll deal with that later. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And, come on, and, and, what's the next word? Has. Has is past tense. Not will, not gone, and has. Made us, come on now, kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what has he made us now? Kings and priests. I want you to understand what God has labeled you, what, what title he has given us. What, see, nah, see y'all going to see. See, we started out bottom wrong. But it says he has made us. See, and most people never never get the the concept that we are kings and priests. Every one of us. I'm not just a priest, I'm a king and a priest. You aren't just a king, you're a king and a priest. You got it? I'm both, you're both. So we're kings and priests unto our God. We're kings. We're kings. Now, if, if you ever thought about and discovered and really, really, really grabbed a hold of your kingship, it would kind of change how you operate. It would kind of change, change how you walk, kind of, kind of change your standards, kind of change, you know, how you, how you live and change what you expect and change how you let your children do. And it kind of change, change how you let people, people talk to you. And when you understand, wait, we're kings? Kings. Oh, boy. Let, let, let's, let's get to something here. Go, go to Psalm 113. I don't, want, I don't want to dig into that too much and, and, and not share what this other thing over here. Everybody say, I'm a king. I'm a king. And, a and a priest. I'm royalty. I'm royalty. Boy, boy. 
royalty. I'm royalty. You don't change. Yep. Found out who I was. I, I don't know. I don't know I was a king. I didn't know. But now that I found out who I am, yeah, I have changed. I, I don't got brand new on you. Yep. 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 I've been, I've been made a king. Now I don't understand everything about my role to yet. I don't understand it all. But I am being transformed. By the nurturing of my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm getting starting to get a grasp of who I am. I'm starting to get a picture of how I'm supposed to behave, and what things I'm supposed to be able to to do. You know, kings kings decree things. You know, king, kings kings can can scatter with their eyes. Hallelujah! So I, I'm I'm learning what it is to be a king. All right, now watch this. Psalm 113. Are you there? Now, we're looking at the fact, we're talking about, again, making something out of nothing. That it is, it is always been, it is right now, Father God's will to raise his people up. From no matter where you started from, no, no matter where you started from, he wants to raise you up, and he can raise you up, and he will raise you up. We're looking here in Psalm 113, and we're, again, focusing on two verses here. Verse 7. It says, he, this is God, this is the one who is said above, he's high above all nations, his glory is above the heavens, nobody like him, and so forth. He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap. This is, this is what he does. It didn't, didn't say he, he puts people in the dust. It says he raises the poor out of the dust. Well, Pastor, I was born poor. I wasn't like so-and-so. That's, that's cool if you're born poor because he raises the poor. <laughs> you see, that, that's the thing you got to get. It doesn't matter where you start. With, with God, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you, if you were born into a wealthy family or born in, born in the projects in the hood. It doesn't matter that, that if, if you can get a hold of God and God can get a hold of you and is working it on the inside of you, he, this is what he does. He raises the poor out of the dust. He raises the poor out of the dust. That, that word poor is, is the Hebrew word dal, dal, which means low, poor. Weak, thin, because in other words, when you thin is a is a sign of poverty. <laughs> I, I don't care. I don't care about all the cosmopolitan magazines that they put out there. Like thin is in. No, thin is a sign you broke. Thin. I didn't make this up. This was in there. Low. Come on now. I mean, some countries, I walk into some countries, they'll, they'll know I'm a baller. <laughs> right? No, I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely serious. You walk, you walk into third world nations, second world nations, they, God. So, right? Hallelujah. You know, you, you, you know, used to be, you go home to grandma's house and you look too thin. Grandma say, baby. All right? So this poor is thou, low, poor, weak, thin, one who is low. So he raises the one who is low out of the dust. Because people, when they're low, that's where they are. They're in the dust. They're in the dust. Hallelujah. But he raises the poor. I remember Pastor Kim got the revelation one night, somewhere in the middle of the night, I think it was, when God, God said he can't do anything with the poor but make them rich. Because people have this, this conception, well, you know, I'm poor. God can use me. No, this is what God does with the poor. He raises the poor out of the dust. Because he can't use it until he raises you. And, and people in the church fight prosperity, fight wealth, because they think, no, poor is some kind of sign that God is in my life. No, poverty ain't no sign God is in your life. If God's in your life, he's raising you up. He raises the poor out of the dust. Now watch this. And lifts the needy 
out of the ash heap. That word needy, listen to this word needy. It is a Hebrew word evyon, 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 which means in want, chiefly poor, subject to oppression and abuse. When you're needy, it says you're subject to oppression and abuse. Right? Payday loan people, they target the needy. And oppress and abuse. Yeah, you're not going to find an M. Scott out there on Snell Island. No, no, no. You understand this here? There is a diabolical scheme to keep the poor and needy poor and needy. And everything that they do, e e listen, let me tell you something. Don't be fooled even by these politicians and people who say, oh, we're going to fight for the poor. Most of them are fighting to get money in their pocket. Because right. they know every grant they get, every, every 501c3 they set up, they, they hire themselves and all their family. Come on now. And, and that's, that, that's right. And they set up, they get a, a $500,000 grant, they spend $400,000 of it on administrative fees. I'm telling you the truth. It goes on right here in our own city. All the talking heads, all the people think we're going to help all the black people, all the, all the poor people. No, they ain't helping nobody but them and their kids and their brother-in-law and sister-in-law. Money gets gone just like that. The people who needed it never actually got it. But that's not how God is. <laughs> God, he's going to raise the poor out of the dust. God lifts the needy out of the dunghill, out of the ash sheep. That word needy again Subject to oppression and abuse. You know who pays all the all bank fees? It's the poor and needy. Those people don't pay no bank fees. <laughs> yeah, they, they make fees. I mean, it's, it's the way they set this thing up, boy. See, if, if, you, if you stay blind to it, you'll keep putting your head on the chopping block every time. And thank you getting over every time. Oh, man, look at that. And you'll, 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 you'll get a tax refund. I'm going to mess with somebody now. You'll get your tax refund, and you don't know all they wanted you to do is get that so you can go back and spend it over here. It's a dirty game. It just over and over and over. They keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And we just keep laying our head on the chopping block. It's oppression and abuse. Needing help. Deliverance from trouble, especially as delivered from God. Notice this last part. It's a general reference to the lowest class. <laughs> general reference to lowest, not just low class, Lowest class. But notice what God, it says here about God. He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the lowest class. See, I got to say that because this is why we had to go this way today because, I mean, I had some other place I wanted to go, but it's like you got, you got to still wrestle with people who, who are thinking, uh, ain't no chance for me. Listen, he takes the lowest class. Doesn't matter where you are, where you started, what you have, what you don't have. If you'll obey his voice, yeah. heed his word, yeah. he'll lift the poor, he'll raise up the lowest class. Notice what it says here. Out of the ash heap, that, wait a minute. He ain't done here, see, is he? He says, because it's one thing to be lifted up. Raised up. So, so, you know, the whole war on poverty, 
You know that war on poverty we had since the 1970s? Yeah. Lyndon Johnson started this war on poverty. We're going to raise the poor people up. First of all, it's backfired because poverty, the poverty rate is higher today than it was in the 1970s. But secondly, if, even if you were going to raise them up, how far were you going to raise them? Come on now, let, let's talk about the plan. How far, Mr. Johnson, how far, and all you other people, how far were you going to raise them up? And see, if what happens is the poor and needy keep looking to the government to raise them up. Keep looking to the people to raise them up. But even if they could raise you up, they're only going to raise you up to a certain level because they're not going to raise you up to move into their neighborhood. Come on now. Somebody help me now. They're, they're, gonna, they're, they're not going to raise you up so you can come to their country club. They're not going to raise you up to, to, where, to where now you can, you can get your own yacht. They'll raise you up where you can work on their yacht. Come on now. They, they might raise you up to, to sit, you know, in the restaurant, but they don't want to raise you up to own a franchise. They're they not, they not, they not, no, 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 no. That there's, that there's a certain level, a certain limit to how much they want to raise people up because they understand that for society to continue the way it is, there has to be separate classes. I'm born preaching better than y'all letting know. It, 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 for, for it to function the way it functions, there has to be a separation of classes. There has to be the haves and the have-nots. Or if not, it throws all society out of balance. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Yeah. So no matter what they do, they're, they're only re- lift up to, to a... We get, okay, instead of, instead of you being below water, we'll let you get your nostril just right above the water. But that's not God. Because God said, not only will I raise up the poor and lift up the needy, but my plan, my goal is that, says that he may seat him with princes. Oh, now we see his end goal. It's not just to get you where you, you, got, you got a little more than you had or you're doing a little better than you had. Now, now you out of the ghetto and in the hood. No, we, we want to get you. Now he said, I want you to, to live in the best neighborhood. Come on, it's, 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 that's what, did y'all, y'all didn't see it said that? He said this, to, to seat him with the princes. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute now. Okay, now you can, you can, you can sit in the front of the plane. This, 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 that seat with princes. Oh, seat him, seat him at, at the club. <laughs> y'all don't like this stuff here. You can, he can see them in, oh, that neighborhood, okay. See, my wife and I had always, we, we've been, not always, we talked about this the last few years, because we wanted to be English. Maybe you can help us with this after church or something. You know, we, we'd see a lot of the, the, the uppity do uh, people, you know, of, of our persuasion. And they, you know, they become doctors and lawyers and good jobs and stuff. But we're like, how come they all still live like right here? Come on. You, you see, you notice that too? It's just like they, 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 they all still live like right here. They don't, I mean, you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars, but you still, oh, because they'll let you get the degree. They'll let you come work, but they're not going to let you come live. Y'all ain't saying it to me. I'm, I'm telling you, see, maybe y'all, maybe y'all had y'all head in the sand in the last 30 years, but I, see, I grew up here. I, I know this is my city. I know this city here. And, and as much as we want to have one seamless city, they, they try to keep some seams in it. <laughs> it's, it's, some, it's some seams in this city here. And, 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 and it, they might want to make it seamless, but they want to keep some seams, even, even, this, even if there's some invisible seams. You understand that? See, and if you're going to ever break... See, some of y'all are like, I don't care. I don't live in that kind of neighborhood anyway. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You, ain't, you don't want to have six deadlocks on your door every time and take you 20 minutes to open your door and go outside. You don't want that. Don't we 
ain't lying to me. <laughs> you don't, you don't want to keep picking up everybody else's garbage out of your yard. You ain't, you, you ain't, come on, stop playing with me now. You don't want because somebody have a birthday party, you can't even get into your driveway because they block your driveway for their party and look at you funny if you want to get in your driveway. <laughs> See, there's some different kind of neighborhoods and different, different ways people live. Different restaurants and different, different, there's different things. Hallelujah. That's, that's what's going on. And oh yeah, well, well, we, we want to we help the folk. We want to help the people. And you know the politicians, they all, they all run, you know, election time, they all run all to our churches. You, the, they, they, don't, they don't run the, the First Baptist Gandhi. They, they don't run the St. Peter's Cathedral downtown. No, they run the all Second Baptist and Third Baptist and, you know, they, they won't run. We love all the people. But they're going to help you long enough to get their name on the ballot and get, their, get, their, get in the office. And then you, you can't come on now. Let's stop falling for the okie doke And putting our trust. Now, <laughs> Pastor, you don't turn political. I'm not being political. I'm being, I'm being, I'm being biblical. I'm saying to you and I that our trust is not to be in the princes and the people. Our trust is to be in God because when God gets a hold of your life, he will, who prays? he will raise you up, but he'll put you in a high place to put you in a seat among the princes. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm telling you, yes, sir. Somebody say, yes, sir. Say, this is for me. down in your neighbor if you're living whatever whatever I'm not you know but praise God see what I'm telling you is that wherever you are God will start right where you are <laughs> praise God thank you Lord he says that he may see them with prince with the princes with the princes of his people so the princes are supposed to be his people. The princes are supposed to be his people. The princes are supposed to be his people. Not those people. His people. And yet what we've been doing is we've been living, acting like the servants. <laughs> that one place in Ecclesiastes where it talks about the evil that's under the sun that the princess are walking while the servants are on the horses. That's the evil of the sun. The ones are supposed to be the servants. That's the world. They're riding the horses. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now, so I might have started out in the lowest class. I'm probably the only one in here that started out in the lowest class. Anybody else that started out in the lowest class? But I'm, I'm changing classes. <laughs> See, his end is that I become part of the high class, the upper class. I'm, I become part of the first class. I become part of the upper echelon of society. I become part of the creme de la creme of society. Can I talk to y'all in here today? But I can't get there if I never get my mind wrapped around it. If I never begin to be transformed by the renewing of my mind, because God's not going to take me to living out there on, on, the, on the snail aisle or, or, the, or, the, or the, you know, one of them places like that, and, and I'm, still, I'm still dumping my garbage in the, in, the, in, the, in the dumpster with no bags on it. I'm just messing with somebody now. That's just, that, ain't even, that ain't even spiritual. That's just. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
So we're to be set among princes. I said we're to be set among princes. All right, now we know Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, right? But let's look at Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. I like Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel 7. A lot, a lot of stuff in there about us. Daniel 8, verse 23. Let's start there. Y'all there? It says, and in the latter time of their kingdom, of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness. Remember I talked about that when I first started this series about fullness? That there's a fullness of sin, a fullness of transgression. In other words, God has a certain capacity that he's going to allow sin and transgression to get to. And at some point, the world's going to max out on sin or we're getting close. Watch what he says there. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. This is a devilish king here. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. This is the Antichrist we're talking about here. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. So don't be uh, surprised when you see this. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. God's chosen people. Many of them will not, you know, they're going to fall away. Watch this, verse 25. Through his cunning or through his deceit, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. This is referring to the world. Now watch this line. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. You see that capitalized prince? When it's capitalized, you know it's referring to Jesus. And notice what he calls him, the prince of princes. But he shall be broken without human means or without human hands. In other words, he's going to rise against Jesus, but he ain't going to be able to beat Jesus. And human hands ain't going to beat him. God's going to beat him himself. But what I want you to take note in that verse here, it says, the prince of princes. Now, we know we call Jesus Christ the king of kings. Capital K, kings of kings, lowercase k. Lord of lords, right? right? Now, you and I, if you've been around me long enough, you know that when it says king of kings, it's not talking about king over the king of Russia. and, and It's talking about us. We're the kings he's king of in the body of Christ. He's king of kings. Remember, we, he's made us kings. He's lord of lords. We're the lords he's lord of. We're to be the landlords. You got it? But it also, now we learn today that he's the prince of princes. So we're the princes that are supposed to be on the horses. We're the princes that are supposed to be ruling in the earth today. Hallelujah. Now go, go back to Psalm, please. Psalm 110. I got to move on. My time is, is wasting away. Psalm 110. Psalm 110, because I, I want to show you something here today. I don't want to put this off to Wednesday. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord, that's all caps Lord, meaning uh, that's God, Jehovah, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies, what? The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Now, where is the, his strength going to come out of? Who is Zion? That's us. Zion is the church. Got it? So he's going, the strength of, of the Lord is going to come out of the church. That's why we got to be strong and not be weak. Got it? Rule in the midst. So we're supposed to be ruling with Jesus Christ in the midst of the enemies. Not, we're ruling. We're, <laughs> you know, in, in societies they have something called the ruling class. We're supposed to be part of the ruling class. Y'all got this? So it says, ruling the midst of your enemies. Verse 3, your people shall be what? Volunteers. We're volunteers. In the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. Watch verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not relent 
You are, Jesus Christ is, a priest forever according to what? The order of Melchizedek. The order of Melchizedek. So Jesus Christ is a priest today after the order of Melchizedek. Got it? Now go to Genesis 14 real quick. Genesis 14. I'm going to show you one verse here. Y'all still got a few minutes? Genesis 14. Genesis 14 and verse 18. Says, then Melchizedek, king of Salem brought out wine, bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. I'm done. Did y'all catch that? <laughs> He's the king of Salem, but also priest of God. So Melchizedek, Melchizedek was king and priest. And the Bible says Jesus Christ is in the order of Melchizedek. So he's also king and priest. If any man be in Christ, come on now, he's a new creation, which means you and I are now created as kings, come on now, and priests. That's our new creation reality. We are kings and priests now unto our God. You and I are part of the ruling class. Boy, this will help somebody, boy, if you get this here. We're part of the ruling class. Ruling class. The ruling class. Everybody say I'm part of the ruling class. Now, I'm almost done here because I'm just showing you again. His, his goal is to lift us up out of the dunghill, out of the ash heap, out of the dust, to set us among princes. He's trying to show us where we belong here. All right, now, can, let's see if y'all can find this scripture here. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Let's see how quickly y'all can find that. Matthew 1, verse 1. I'm trying to show you what God's trying to do to us to make something out of nothing. Too many of us have seen ourselves as lower class and still see ourselves that way because we could keep comparing the natural to the natural. But if we begin to see ourselves as the upper class, as the ruling class, we'll begin to rule in the midst of the enemies. How does a young lady walk into a, a guy who owns a condominium? He owns 10 of them in that, in that same... Uh, complex there, and tell him when, when she's going to pay him. <laughs> no, that don't make any sense because if he don't own it, he in charge. Right. Nope. You rule. Right. See, I, I heard Bashara say this earlier. I heard you say it. See, what we need to go to do is go to the car lot and tell him what we're going to pay, when we're going to pay it, whatever. Now, see, if we, if we can get that ruling class mentality, not underclass, not lower class, ruling class. It'll change how we live. Matthew chapter 1. I want to show you something here. We'll close out. Matthew 1 verse 1. How many of y'all have ever read Matthew 1? <laughs> not many of us because it start out with this begotten, begat, begat, and begotten, begot. So most of us don't spend time in Matthew chapter 1. If we do, we jump right down to verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. Every Christmas, we read that. <laughs> but let's look at Matthew 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Genealogy. His lineage. His heritage. Of Jesus Christ. The son of David. The son of Abraham. That's it. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And you look at verse 2, just for sake, Abraham begot Isaac. That's how the ball got started, right? Look down at uh, verse 6. And Jesse... 
begot David the king. <laughs> Y'all missing. See, you, see it, he was careful to point this out. Because you look at David the king, David the king, David the king begot Solomon. Well, didn't Solomon become king? Yeah. Uh, wasn't uh, Rehoboam, verse 7, he was a king. But Abijah was a king. Asa was a king. Jehoshaphat was a king. Joram was a king. Uzziah was a king. Your king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, right? Uh, Ahaz was a king. Hezekiah was a king. Manasseh was a king. Josiah down there. They, these, are, these are all kings. But the Bible didn't talk about their kingship. But it said, Jesse begot David. It was careful to point out the king. Now what happens after David all his, his son, his grandson, great-grandson, so on and forth, they are all kings, and the Holy Spirit doesn't have to point it out. Because once you get a king, from then on out, anybody born into the family, it's understood. So, when the Bible says, the book of the genealogy, genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, we know is David the king, we know Jesus is a king. If any man be in Christ, which means we're now, all right, now, here's what I wanted to point out very quickly before we close out, is that it pointed out David being a king, right? It called Jesus Christ in Matthew 1, verse 1, the son of David, the son of Abraham. What's interesting about these two men is this. Notice again it says David was a king. David the king. Did you see about his father Jesse? Huh? Did you all read that in there about Jesse? What did it say about Jesse? He just begot. What does it say about Obed? That's his granddaddy. He just begot. So in other words, Jesse wasn't a king. Obed was not a king. Boaz was not a king. You keep going up the lineage. Was not a king. David is said the king. If you know David's story, David didn't start out as a king. Wasn't born into a royal family. He was in the dust. He was in the dunghill. He was in the ash heap. He was a keeper of the sheep, which in that time was the lowest class. Y'all got to catch this here. He was born and became part of the lowest class of people there could be in a society. But he was a God lover. He was a God praiser. He was a God worshiper. He was a God truster. And when God went looking for a man to become king, when he looked, went looking for a man to raise up, because remember Saul was king. But Saul disobeyed God. And the Bible says promotion does not come from the east or the west or the south, but God puts down one and puts up another. So God found David in the sheepfold, keeping the sheep. David was like third shift sheepfold. He was like the lowest class of person on the planet. But God. See, I, I, got, I got to get you to see this here because, because, because see, some of y'all thinking again, I, I can't go up there. No, God, listen, God, it doesn't matter where he finds you. If That's right. You can be the lowest on the totem pole, the, the, the black sheep of your family. David was getting ready. He, David got so excited about God, David wanted to build God a house. And David said, you know, I'm going to build God a house. God has been so good to me. And the prophet came to him and said, no, no, you can't, uh, God, he said, God said, no, I, I don't need you to build my house. He said, he said, 
when you were out there with a the sheepfold, I found you and I raised you up. I appreciate it, good thought, but I, I'll let your son do it. But he told him, you was in the sheepfold when I found you. See, now when you see that, you understand a little more about his praise. When they went and got that Ark of the Covenant to bring that Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. And the Bible says every six paces he stopped and do a jig, he do a dance, he, he, he go crazy with a dance. And his wife, his wife, Michael, didn't like it. She said, how dare you dance and debase yourself in front of all the maidens? Now remember, the, and the Bible said this, Michael, Saul's daughter. See, Michael was raised in a royal family. But David said, God raised me up. God, God found me in the sheepfold. You don't know why I danced? It's because I remember where God brought me from. God found me when I was down here, and he brought me a mighty, mighty, mighty long way. And do you think this praise something? Watch this praise I do now. Because I realize if it hadn't been for God, I'd still be out there right now with the sheep. See, that's why some people don't understand other folk praise. But if you, were, if you knew their story, you'd understand their glory. If you knew how much God had raised them up, you'd understand why they praise the way they do, why they cry sometimes, why they shout sometimes, why they dance and run, because God has raised them up from nothing. God specializes in taking people who are nobodies, who have nothing, and raising them up. David the king. Notice, notice in history, history no longer records him as David the shepherd. No, 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 no. It no longer refers to David as David the shepherd boy. History records for all eternity David the king. There's no longer any remembrance or reference to his sheep herding, sheep herding days. Yeah, I think about that first Samuel 17 when God was in the in the process mm -hmm. of raising David up come on, come on. and David showed up there to fight a giant because he was trusted in God. Yeah. Yeah. His brothers, mm -hmm. his brother said, shouldn't you be back there with them little sheep? Watch out. You got to watch out for your brothers who want to send you back to the sheep come on. when there's a king priest anointing on your life. God's raising them up. Taking them somewhere. Because that's what God does. He takes nothing. It's at least three of y'all in here know what I'm talking about. He, he, he took nothing. And, he, and, and you know what? I, I, got, I got news for you. And he ain't through with me yet. I dare you to tell your neighbor, he ain't through with me yet. Come on, I dare you to tell somebody else who really cares. He ain't through with me yet. He... I'm going somewhere here. He ain't done with me. Thomas, he ain't done with you. He ain't done with you. At least you come a long way, baby, but he ain't done with you. Matt, you come a long way from where you were, but he ain't done with you. He ain't done till you're sitting among all the princes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. David, the son of Abraham. Uh, the son of David. Uh, Jesus, the son of David. 
Jesus Christ, the son of David. If you think about how many times through scripture when he encountered somebody who, in, who was in need and they hollow out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He kept calling to that, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of a king. You're a king. Then it says, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, says, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Well, why is it called him? Abraham wasn't a king. No, nope, but look at Isaiah 51. Look at Isaiah 51, verse 1. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Verse 2, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you, for I called him with nothing. You read some translations to say with nothing. And I blessed him and increased him. So God took Abraham with nothing. You know, when God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham didn't have anything. He told him, leave your father, your father's house, all your kindred, all your kind. Leave all your people, leave all your stuff. They left everything. They left everything. Left everything. First thing he does is gets him down there in Egypt. He walks out of Egypt loaded. Yes, sir. Y'all didn't, didn't catch that. He who comes out of Egypt, Genesis 13, says he's extremely rich. God's blessed him. But God brought him from nothing. <laughs> because God specializes in taking people who have nothing. The Bible says Abraham sojourned through the land. Yes. When you look at that word sojourn in the Hebrew, you know what it means? It means it doesn't mean to, just to pass through. It literally means to pass through and walk around as if you own it. So Abraham wasn't just passing through like, well, I'm just passing through here on my way to the promised land. No, he walked around like he owned the place. And everywhere he went, people wanted to give him stuff. His wife died, and he got ready to bury her, and he was look, looking for a place. They said, oh, no, Abraham, take, you can have that. You can have that. He said, no, I ain't, no I'm, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to buy it. They're they trying to give him everything because he walked around like he's the guy in charge. Right, right. Amen. Why? Because God has put an anointing on his life. Hallelujah. Raised him up. And the Bible specifically calls Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. And if any man be in Christ. <laughs> He's a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. God specializes in taking nothing, making something out of it. Remember Ruth? The Moabitess, Moabitess widow, had nothing, but God made sure she connected with her, with somebody else in covenant. Out there gleaning in the field. Gleaning in the field was what poor people did. The lowest class. She was getting the leftovers of what everybody else harvested. She was living on leftovers. I'll mess with somebody here. She was living on leftovers. But God took somebody with nothing. Raised them all the way up. Now you check Jesus Christ's lineage. There's Ruth. Boaz married Ruth. Gave birth to Obed. Obed gave birth to Jesse. Jesse gave birth to David. The king. Come on now. Rahab. Come on now. That's the lowest class now. She was a harlot. Woman of the night. Didn't make any difference. She messed around and got on God's side. And God took nothing. She's in Jesus Christ's lineage too. She's in the list. Jesus, Jesus is a descendant of Rahab. <laughs> Jesus took some old fishermen. Peter and John, you remember those guys? Nothing. Made him something. 
mean, this is it's what he does. He lifts us out of the dung heap, out of the, out of the dust, out of the ashes. Raises us up. Those of us who have been lowest class, he raises us up. That, that's why I don't, I don't preach on blackness. I don't preach that socio-political stuff. That's not what God told Moses to preach. You preach to my people, I brought them here on eagle's wings. Made them kings and priests. That's why I preach to you like that. So you become everything God called you to be. You become the maximum God called you to be. And uh, we start ruling here, D. We start being in the ruling class. Everybody say, I'm in, class. I'm in the ruling class. Say, I'm in charge here. I'm in charge here. You ought to go back to your neighborhood and say, I'm in charge, and go back to your school, I'm in charge. Come on now. I'm in charge. There's a new sheriff in town. Matt, I'm telling you, you walk in there with a white suit like that and just stand there, you just stand up, stand up, Matt. I'm going to show you how to do, you do it. You got to stand up like this. You got to, like, just take your, your jacket and just stand like this. See, you do that, boy, they'll all back. Whoa. The new sheriff in town. I'm telling you. But you can't rule out there till you get rulership in here. This is who God called us to be. Rulership. 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 I'm a king and a priest. I rule in the midst of the enemies. I rule. That's the maximized life here. Now, what, what we're going to get into here in, in uh, Lord's willing this, this week, this Wednesday, is what my whole point of this message, of this series has been to get us to this message sub-series on the demanders anointing. That's the whole point about getting us through all these messages here. Because like Lee said, I hadn't preached it yet, but it's already been prophesied over me and over this house. If you're, if you're you know, properly aligned, the same demand as, a, see, that's what rulers, rulers demand. You know, the Bible says, says uh, the rich answer harshly. It says the poor use entreaties. Y'all read that in Proverbs? The poor, the poor got a bet. Please, can you, uh, you know, can you, uh, please? But the rich answer roughly. Rich, no, what we're going to do, we're going to do, do it like this. We're going to, no, do it like this. Yeah. Now we change the names right here. This, see, this is how God wants you to. Now, He, he don't want you to, to, to be mean. I'm not talking, talking about you being mean. I'm talking about you being direct and in charge. Well, you rulers, as a ruler, you decree a thing. The Bible says uh, in Proverbs, says, by me, wisdom, this is wisdom talking, by me, kings decree justice. Kings just, you just speak it. You know, the Bible says kings, kings can scatter with their eyes. They just look at you wrong. Look at you right. Oh. <laughs> See, you can walk into a, into a room, you know, mo most times we go in there trying to, somewhere trying to get a job. Rulers don't get a job. Rulers take a job. <laughs> Is y'all hiring? No, ain't it's y'all hiring. <laughs> No, that's not how rulers act. See, but it's all got to switch up in here. And if we get it, we'll move into a level of operation that will, that will change our lives and our children's lives and our family's lives and the lives of the world because when, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. We can straighten the world out when we get an authority and live like it. Amen? Y'all received that this morning? Well, come on and give God a praise and let him know you appreciate the word today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.